so. I mean, the world is a bit like a wheel right now without a center, isn't it? It's very... Uh wobbling, disturbed entity. I don't think you need to be a rocket scientist or a prophet to recognize that the world's going through a lot of wobbles right now. And um, the real missing piece, in my opinion, is this kind of core human experience of, of being awake, of waking up because that gives us a true access and the word for suffering in Buddhism actually has this connotation of a wobbling wheel. So if we're wobbling individually in our lives, then it's to be expected that the world as all well is going to be wobbling. But if we address that whole issue of wobbling in our lives and find that axis that gives rise to a quality of awakened serenity and full-heartedness and of course we're making a con contribution to the um, to the world a positive one and uh, it seems obvious that if we have this potential hardwired within us which I believe we all do for awakening and if being awake is the culmination and definition of who and what we truly are then it's obviously going to be problematic if we don't attend to it yet we're living in a culture where but it's not generally spoken of there's just a few little people and little church halls and things around the place and some weird kind of few sort of teachers of awakening and enlightenment that aren't really considered to be part of mainstream culture who are doing a little bits of teaching here and there but in general it's just not a popular activity <laughs> whereas it's the definition in my mind of what really being a human being is about and it's really quite an amazing omission that uh, you know the education in this doesn't begin at a very early age in fact education in this journey doesn't begin at a very early age in fact, it's an amazing fact that as a monk, I saw many classes of school children and many religious education teachers, and I never met one who actually knew what the word religion meant. Because there's a reality to be, to be seen, and the seeing of that is to be awake. And it transcends all beliefs and doctrine. It really transcends religious... The fact of impermanence, you know, it transcends any kind of religious position you might have. And it's, and it's not a belief, is it? You don't need to believe in that. It's a pointer. It's a pointing out instruction to look at something, experience it for yourself. So it's a very, um, then that means it's a very kind of mature path, this path, because we're being encouraged to grow out of that habit of believing in things and cultivate the habit of checking in and seeing things <laughs> seeing if they make sense in the light of our own experience so even the whole process of believing and the whole process of views and opinions is quite interesting to examine because people push views and opinions very strongly people believe that they have an answer whereas there's multiple answers there is no absolute answer so when um the mind's awake, it recognizes that uh, nothing's true except the truth. And the truth is dynamic. The truth is, is realized here and now in the moment. And the wisdom born of that deals with situations appropriately as they arise, but it doesn't have to construct what is ultimately just a defensive mechanism, which is a belief system. So when you switch on the radio in the morning and you hear these people who have these kind of adamant views and opinions about things what they're really doing are defending themselves against reality and the certainty and force and with which they express these views and opinions and the confidence with which they express these views and opinions is a simply a sign of their reactivity their anxiety their their fear about not knowing something for sure <laughs> it's an addiction 
it's actually, you know, it's, it's a primary addiction. We all have various addictions to different various things, but if you look at even what's going on in your own mind, you'll recognize there's a kind of wanting to get a thought of some sort that's in some way conclusive and will solve all your problems. <laughs> will solve that feeling of deficiency that we have here and now, and that's to be accepted and expected. That feeling of deficiency is not to be regarded as a sign of failure or as a sign that you are per somehow personally deficient. In Buddhist tradition, it's considered to be a realization. It's a noble truth to be able to recognize that right here, right now, the kind of starting point is a feeling of deficiency, that somehow things could be more than this. And so that's a realization. And if you come to that realization, there'll be a certain quality of presence in the background that is also begins to wake up, a quality of awakening, a quality, a lightness of mind. It's like a little spark. I mean, we all have a certain recognition that there's a little kind of an electrical kind of intelligence that's working inside of us. Sometimes we say we're on top form or we're someone's got that sparkle in their eyes or we're really buzzing or something, you know, there's a quality within every human being. It's like a current of aliveness, a current of intelligence. Well, that can come to maturity, liberate it from the, the sort of emotional, mental prison that we get caught in. So when our minds get caught in this prison, we're having a constant convers internal conversation. When emotionally we get in this prison, we get addicted to intense emotional patterns of greed, hatred, delusion, or confusion that are also linked to our thinking. So we get locked into these loops of thinking and feeling very intensely about things. So when the mind becomes out of this prison, then the mind becomes clear like luminous space and the heart no longer is defined by emotions but is informed by feeling intelligence feeling intelligence and the impression of solidity in things that is experienced through the mind is no longer experienced in that way but things lose their solidity are not so clearly defined and the heart discovers an experience of intimacy with the, with the existence itself, which draws it in, which it surrenders to. The experience of if existence is an intimate experience, as experienced through the heart and then through the mind is an experience of serenity and clarity and wisdom and insight. So it's not even that thinking ceases entirely, it's just that thinking becomes into alignment with, with these principle of feeling intelligence and clear seeing and, and a mind that is not obs obscured by busyness. So when we meditate and we, I mean, that's the describing the potential, but the reality then is usually can be different. The heart could be heavy or the heart could be full of fear or anxiety or the heart just could be nothing. Just could be, because often we're numb below the neckline. I mean, if you look at our society, men wear ties, which is like a cho is kind of like a choker. You know, we're living in an age. We're living in an age that is very thought orientated. You know, it's very. We're living in a sort of certain kind of a scientific age where if something can't be defined conceptually, then it has no validity, has no truth. And because of that, then we we've become quite separated from nature not just nature in terms of like trees and plants and animals we become disconnected from that certainly but the nature of this existence here this body your physical body your your birth is a natural process your human existence is a you're born of the, the universal nature and we've become out of touch with that and that's the source of great unhappiness in our lives <laughs> Great, um, a great misfortune if we don't reconnect with the depth of who we are in the course of our lifetime. So 
we say the Buddhist path is good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end. So it doesn't really matter what is there when you put the brakes on and check in to see what's really going on. If there's busyness, then we cultivate a, a quality of allow, allowing the busyness to be there, a quality of patience with the busyness. We're not, we're renouncing or letting go in a sense the the concern for any having a particular experience or the concern for getting rid of anything because in truth the content of our experience doesn't define who and what we are what defines who and what we are is whether we are awake to our experience or we're caught like a fly in a web with our experience and so whether you're it's busyness whether you're upset whether you feel contracted and dark and numb or whether you feel expanded, open and sensitive, it has to do with um, <coughs> whether we can be present for that, allow that to be there without resorting to getting involved in a story about what that means about who and what we are. So. And then, so, it is a practice to keep learning to... Um, allow for uh, learning to allow for we don't want to be present and to let go of it so that then we don't feel fragmented by thought or feelings or sensations or emotions or because there's enough awareness to stay centered and not get pulled about anymore so really so wherever you're beginning, it's a question of learning not to get pulled about. And the way we let go then of not being pulled about is by attending to the breath. Because through, through attending to the breath, we're not getting sucked into things because we're actually getting sucked into the breath. And the breath is um, current. The breath is, is true. Whereas what we're imagining and talking about in our heads most of the time is usually in the past or in the future. <laughs> It's always in the past or in the future, actually. You can't really think presence. You can only know presence. So. Thinking is always an abstraction of, of what is. So you, our thinking is usually either involved with something that may or may not happen in the future, something bad or something go good that's going to happen in the future, something bad or something good that happened in the past. Or has to do with somebody else that's good or bad in your life. <laughs> so there are usually those four directions the mind goes in. Past, future, self, and other. There's something really bad happening now. Um, yeah. Is it just delusional to say, oh, it's all right? It well, you're not saying that. You, you don't, it's just saying it's all right is just thinking it's all right. It's not rendering it all right through insight. Two completely different things. So, you know, when you're living in the moment, you're not thinking, I'm living in the moment. But there's a, like I'm saying, there's that quality of intelligence. It's like when you say you're in your own form or whatever, or when, you know, you've got that kind of, you know, you're in the flow, you know, when you're in the zone. Athletes, when they're in the zone, or football players, when they're in the zone, you get that moment where everything just like flows naturally. Well, similarly, if you've got problems and you're in the zone of presence, then you just deal with them without losing presence. And there's an intelligence and responsibility or an ability to respond that just spontaneously moves through you. Yeah, well, that, that's just dishonesty. Yeah. <laughs> that's partly what meditation's for. People think, often people come to meditation because they might have an unconscious desire to have an experience, or in particular, a spiritual experience. I often think of meditation as being more like just a kind of a way of checking in on how honest you are with yourself. Because honesty is, a, is one of the parameters, it's one of the factors that facilitates waking up. You have to be honest about what's really going on for yourself. 
So what we're doing in our mind's eye most of the time is creating a kind of image of ourselves being okay. And we're projecting a future that's going to be perhaps even better than okay. But we're, it's almost like we're kind of creating comfort. We're creating an image of comfort, an image of well-being that might not in fact be true. So then meditation is saying, well, let's just check in without distraction and get a felt sense of whether how much ease there truly is here and now. And let's learn to acquire the skills to cultivate the conditions that are going to promote more and more ease as a result of uh, being present in that way. <laughs> See, well, we, it's interesting because we have an ima- we've got an imagination as well, and that and the imaginal mind doesn't cease either. You know, so well, so when the imaginal mind is out of alignment with our true nature, then it tends to imagine fearful scenarios, and it imagines that acquiring money is going to make it safe, and it imagines that losing money is going to render it unsafe, and it's very self-referencing. It's very self-protective. And it's actually quite narcissistic and self-absorbed, whereas when it becomes more attuned to the way things are and certainly more attuned to the experience of intimacy with the world that the feeling body connects to when it becomes awakened, there is more of an appreciation for the predicament of others, in a sense. In fact, the whole structure of thinking of self and others begins to drop away. And there's a recognition that essentially we're, in fact, kind of one body. Apparently, we're all separate people. But essentially, we're born of the same stuff. We're, we're like, you know, we're like waves arising in the ocean, but the ocean itself is one. So if you're seeing the bigger picture and not looking at the waves in isolation, but looking, have an, an appreciation for the ocean, then our imaginal mind starts to then think in terms of the flourishing of others and <coughs> derives a sense of security, the flourishing, the flourishing of others. And it derives not on a sense of security from that, but it reinforces the rootedness in the experience of reality because, you know, if there is truth or there's a true principle, that true principle desires the same for everybody. The human heart wants everyone to flourish, not just me. The idea of me getting rich at the expense of other people doesn't make sense. But if I get rich then I would use that to enable other people to enrich other lives and to take the sort of misery and inequity out to address that as much as possible. Partly, you could say, you could say almost for selfish reasons because it accords with my happiness, my well-being, and it makes my happiness and well-being even more complete. But we're living in a world where there is a lot of fear and concern for survival and feeling of threat in relation to other. We feel very threatened. You know, it's like we want to build our castle and our moat and know that we can shut everybody else out. Well, that's just a, you know, I mean, we all have this, in this country, Particularly, there's an obsession with her, the home, isn't there? Everybody wants this home. This the home, what they say, the is an Englishman's castle. Is that what they say? So, um, it's an image for the self. You know, we imagine we have this fantasy that the home is somehow going to protect us from harm. It's going to be a warm, cozy place where there, there's no one's going to. St- be able to steal our stuff. <laughs> so, but it's a fantasy, as we all know. And there's plenty of people with beautiful homes that suffer a lot. It's not whether or not you have a beautiful home. It's whether you're at home in yourself, whether you're at home in life, whether you're at home in the universe. 
So becoming at home in the universe is a more difficult task because it's a big, mysterious place. It's awesome. It's awe-inspiring. It's vast. It's huge from the perspective of our little selves. It's beyond understanding. I mean, we all have an inclination to understand life, don't we? You know, we've all at some point sat under the stars and talked about the meaning of life. You know, we've all got that in us, but... You know, we may have done it when we were younger, but we don't do it anymore because A, we don't think there's an answer, and B, we don't want to be subject to some fanatic's ideas about this and that, or C, we don't want to get lost into a continuous loop of confusion that never leads anywhere. So we just give up on the whole task altogether because in the past our experience never led anywhere other than basically confusion. Or, But the fact is there... There is a way of uh, training ourselves to find that sense of being meaningfully orientated and awake and uh, free from confusion, to know our true purpose and to realize our full potential, which we all sense some, somehow. So it's just uh, it's, it's unbelievable that it's, it's not more obvious. <laughs> So, uh, and that it's not taught at schools, and that it's not discussed on the radio, and it's not discussed on television, and there's no culture of cultivation and realization of our seed potential. It's just a joke. How can that be? In a nice sort of friendly, concerned way. Sure, of course but they're it's concerned. Quite, it's, it's interesting what you say. But also people will always find it challenging because if their yeah. sense of security is built upon a belief system, yeah. they, they do have to keep asserting that belief because and if somebody chooses not to um, participate in that belief it's a challenge that could give rise to some doubt in their own minds. They wouldn't be familiar with how to be present for doubt and not be undone by it. So people with these kinds of belief systems tend to be very dogmatic about them because um, they find consolation in the beliefs. But it's just an abstraction. You can believe that you're going to go to heaven. So if I say to you, believe in Jesus and you're going to go to heaven, you will feel in some sense more secure and more happier, maybe you can, might even feel more happier, you know, you can sort of feel a bit more relaxed about the future because you know you're going to go to heaven and Jesus is going to be there to greet you. So, but that doesn't actually mean to say that's what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara once had a Methodist mm. that was going to pray for her. It's more, it's, a, it's like a child holding on to a teddy bear. I mean, and that teddy bear makes them feel more secure. So when you see them, you don't necessarily rip the teddy bear out of their arms and say, you know, wake up, get real, you know. You, you know, some people, you have to respect that that's, what, you know, people need that crutch. And it's only when construction of mind can only be sustained for so long it will start to melt down at some point and they will start to feel doubt and they will start to feel fear and they will start to feel anxiety and if then they start to uh, you know then you can support people when the cracks appear but there's a saying in psychology where there is a hole the rhinoceros horn will enter so where you're in denial of reality eventually the construct that you've made as an expression of your resistance to reality will get knocked down. And it's, an, it's, a, it's actually a compassionate force of nature. You know, it'll let you hold on to it for so long, but eventually will knock it down and start pushing you towards getting real. I understand what you say about fear because... It makes them extremely unhappy in the end. <laughs> they're, they're basically... Because, what, they're, because the children yeah. will probably I mean what's basically happened is they've mistaken the finger that's pointing to the moon for the moon that's what's happened all religious teachings are they're 
they're basically pointing out instructions. They're trying to get you to see a reality that is beyond doctrine. It's non-doctrinal. It's experiential. It's born of direct intuitive insight, born of direct knowing. And when there is that direct intuitive insight, your head's not full of beliefs. It knows. But if you ha aren't equipped to go on the journey, then you can substitute the real thing for the pointing out instructions. You take refuge in that. Sure. sure. And they were very happy that it was In the end of the day... quite surprising to us. You just have to take each individual on face value. Yeah. I mean, as the genius of what the Buddha taught is pointing to impermanence as the entry point, because that's beyond dispute. It doesn't matter whether you're Richard Dawkins, Stephen Fry, you're atheist, agnostic, or Christian, or Islamic, or whatever. You cannot deny the fact that impermanence is a law of existence, is a law of nature. The problem is that we fail to understand the significance or relevance of that, and it doesn't, impermanence, it doesn't sound like salvation, does it? Like being met by Jesus, you know, on a cloud. <laughs> <laughs> See, impermanence is your salvation, but impermanence is your salvation, because it's, the, it's what the whole thing turns on, the whole thing pivots on, because it's what we are living in reactivity to. The reason we're creating this abstract, notional, verbiage that we're inhabiting most of the time is because we're reacting to the uncertainty inherent in this law of impermanence. But it's just a particular stage in our development. It's like um, when you're riding a bike, you need stabilizers. You know, we resort to our speech mind as a stabilizer to get us to a certain point. And then there's a, a step-off point for the next spurt of growth, the, the next spurt of awakening, which is um, checking out what impermanence truly is about and seeing where it takes you to. So the, you know, the, the three characteristics of existence are what Buddhas always teach. You know, it doesn't matter. They say that there have been many eons, and in these eons there have been different Buddhas, but they always teach these three characteristics of existence, impermanence. Anicca, dukkha, anatta. Anicca, impermanence, dukkha is is the the it's like the thorn of disease that that feeling of impermanence gives rise to, and anatta is the recognition, the realization that it's it's not definitive of who or what I am. It's not me. It's not mine. The body is not me, not mine. My thoughts are not me, not mine. The feelings are not me, not mine. Nothing that arises in the world is me or mine. I am the knower of the world. I am the knower of arising and passing away. I am the knower of impermanence. And that's the great joke, you know, because then it's like, like a prisoner. You've got the key to spring the lock. You just can spring the lock. That's what wisdom is. It springs the lock. And you experience it as joyful because that which is a source of pain becomes an experience of the cessation of pain, that which is the source of limitation becomes the experience of being unlimited, that which is the source of, of old age sickness and death becomes the source of transcending old age sickness and death. So it becomes known. So, and so you can tolerate it with appreciation. <laughs> it's a particular religious structure. It's a psychological approach. It's not a theistic approach like Christianity or the Islamic traditions which are not wrong but they lend themselves to misappropriation there's much more room for an ignorant or confused mind to mistake the finger pointing to the moon for the moon whereas the beauty of what the Buddhist tradition is they keep it very neutral impermanence is neither an exciting prospect or an entirely repellent one it's just it's just neutral whereas if I say you know, you're going to be you're going to be met by Jesus on the road, and there'll be light shining from his eyes, and you will feel full of bliss and happiness. Then you can take refuge just in the image of that. It's it's much more it's a much more enticing kind of idea, to a certain extent. But I mean, there's a huge amount of compensatory activity going on in, in the religious organisations. People are taking compensation in the belief that they're saved 
finding a feeling the feeling a sense of well being in the belief that everything's going to be okay. But the fact is, if you were to sit them down in an empty room for an hour with nothing to do, they may start to get ants in their pants. And that's because, in fact, in reality, they don't feel okay here and now. If you don't feel okay here and now, what, how are you going to feel okay in the future? <laughs> if you're not at ease now, why are you going to be at ease in the future? It's a fantasy. It's a story we tell ourselves. I mean, it's just like different stages of maturity. You've got to, like I say, it is, you know, the, the sort of unenlightened state. We have this egoic structure, which is a t has a function, and we're not trying to get rid of it, but we're trying to grow beyond it. It's like a, a stepping stone for the next step. You know, we go from a baby to being a functional adult. adult. That's one developmental journey. Once we become a functional adult, it's not enough. The next step is to go from a functional adult to a of a fully realized human being that doesn't need to burden themselves with all this sort of stuff, the contraption of dogmas and belief systems. And it's not complicated. It's an awareness as a singularity, form and emptiness. That's all there is. Yeah, it is because you know you can't avoid verbiage, you can't avoid language, you can't avoid using language. I mean, we can just sit in silence, but. There are pointing out instructions. Um, well, when we say, for example, when we say present this idea of impermanence, for example, we say, well, try to look at it and, and, and explore what its meaning is for you. We're asking you to actually start to not believe in it, but not reject it. But take this third way, which is to actually start checking in with your own experience. So it's about taking authority. So a lot of what we're up to is we're giving our authority away to ideas. We're saying, don't give your authority to ideas. If you don't actually know something, how can you believe whether it's true or whether it isn't true? We're trying to point out the next step, which is the step that takes you to maturity, which is to begin to know your own, the landscape of your own body-mind experience. Check out and see for yourself whether or not what's being pointed to, because all it is is pointers, turns out to be true for you. And then you can, then you'll know for sure, based on your own direct experience, whether or not it makes any sense.